Welcome to the Human Performance Outliers podcast with your hosts, Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. At Human Performance Outliers podcast, we dive into a wide range of topics revolving around health, nutrition, and physical fitness. If you enjoy the show and wish to support us, please visit patreon.com forward slash HPO podcast. If you do not use Patreon but still wish to support us, please also consider checking out our PayPal page at paypal.me forward slash HPO pod. The link to both of those can also be found in the show notes. Finally, please consider subscribing to us on your favorite podcast listening platform. Now on to the next topic. All right, we are we are up. Uh, Susie, welcome to the show. Um, if you want to start out by just kind of letting our listeners know a little bit about yourself, you can, and then we can kind of jump in some topics. Sure. So um, unlike other people that have been on this show, I am currently a mom, a stay-at-home mom and a homeschooler. Um, my health journey began probably as soon as I was born. My dad was a chemical engineer and had us reading ingredient labels from the time we could read. So we had like no processed food in the house. Um, it was not a very fun way to grow up when you're, <laughs> you know, when your friends come over for sleepovers. But of course now, 40 years later, I'm extremely thankful that, you know, even having a bag of chips was a huge treat. I remember going to McDonald's like once. Um, and so that transferred over to kind of a natural curiosity and, and being very in tune with what foods did to my body. When you have such a clean slate, you don't realize what a blessing it is to be able to eat something and then have like a really quick response as to that did not make me feel good or that made me feel good. And so I was able to carry that over into my relationship with my husband, who I met when I was like 16. So again, I have this 25 year span with him to be able to like experiment on and then my kids too. So that's a very quick um, intro. So you are now on a, I guess, because I read your story, you, you wrote, you know, like a really nice sort of summary and a lot of neat things over the years. And so you guys have been playing with uh, different dietary strategies over the years. Can you, can you kind of just give us an int- uh, kind of a background on what sort of things you've tried over the years? Sure. So uh, when my husband and I first got married, I was already eating very clean. He came from kind of an opposite background of lots of processed foods, soda constantly, um, extreme ends of the spectrum. And so when we got married, of course, I took over grocery shopping and meal planning. So we ate organic foods, um, very little meat because it was expensive, but, you know, fairly clean compared to the standard American diet. But uh, he started having major issues with anxiety at somewhere around age 25 or so. And with a family history of mental illness, it was kind of a scary time for him to think like, this is going to be the rest of my life. And I'm a natural questioner of things. So I just started looking up like, is there a connection between diet or between mental illness and like family history? Like if you have depression, your mom had depression, are they linked? And of I found out, no, at least they couldn't figure it out then that just because your family had a history of mental illness, that did not mean that you would or wouldn't. There was just, they couldn't find a connection. So to me, that was great because that meant that we could manipulate it using other outside things. So I started looking into food and we tried eating less meat and being more like on the vegetarian side. And that was disastrous and he's kind of a smaller guy and he tanked out really early felt worse really quickly um and then i found a gut healing diet that was get you know called gaps maybe people have heard of that and so it does go into kind of healing the gut and you're on a very restricted diet for a short time but then you very quickly add things in you add in fruit um you know different vegetables and things like that. And although it was really successful early on when we had the meat and very few vegetables and broth, as soon as we brought that other stuff back in, it was not back to like ground zero. We had some stayed success, but it still went backwards. It wasn't this lasting healing or lasting effects that we were looking for. So, you know, we just kept fiddling. I 
was able to hook up with some local farmers. So we just naturally started including more protein in our diet just because that's what we had availability to. And slowly his, you know, anxiety was getting better. These allergies he had had for now almost 30 years were lessening. And so we know we kind of saw a natural progression. The more we sourced food, the more we cleaned up our diet. It was a natural progression, but it wasn't like that story you were looking for where you're like, wow, I changed my diet and I got this instant healing. And so it was kind of frustrating. So then when, after I had my third child um, in 2013, I started feeling really tired and I was nursing and, you know, I already had two kids at home. So I kind of thought, well, maybe this is normal, but it was such a level of exhaustion that I had never felt before. So I was tinkering around online again, like, what do I need to do? Where dietarily, what do I need to do? I'm already sourcing my food. I'm eating clean. I'm getting sleep. I'm getting outside. And I found this program that this woman had set up all on her own. And it was a really low carb, high fat, meat and protein diet, or you could do hundred percent carnivore. And that was empowering in a way that like other people are doing this stuff and they're having success. So I did that for a couple of months. And I mean, within the first two weeks, I was getting up and feeling refreshed. And so, you know, I told my husband, like, you should try this. It's really great. But, you know, he still was drinking his craft beers at night and getting pizza once a week. And it just wasn't worth him at the time to um, get rid of those things. And I'm sure a lot of people can identify with those little treats, you know, after a hard day and, you know, when you're not sure that the outcome is going to be great, it's hard to give up those little, those little things that we treat ourselves with. Um, but that year also my son who is now 12, but at that time he was seven, he started having these allergy issues. And I was like, what the heck? I mean, we eat so clean. The dairy we had was raw and soaking all my grains because we had found the Weston A. Price foundation all our guidelines, like when he was six months old. So I was doing all these right things. And yet, now he starts suffering from the same things that my husband had. So it was really difficult and kind of um, <laughs> just so frustrating to have that happen. So I thought, well, if I'm, you know, 37 and feeling better eating this way, I'm going to try it with my child. And we just told him, hey, do you want to be able to drink milk and not feel crappy and be able to have a more varied diet? He said, yeah, I do. And so we started him on this really restrictive, um, mostly carnivore diet with a few vegetables and his symptoms lessened and lessened and lessened until they completely went away. And then my husband started getting more issues, digestive issues, and he was like losing tons of weight. And it was like two weeks after he turned 40 and he went to the doctor and she said, I can't find anything. Um, I can do an endoscopy, but I can't figure out why you're having these digestive issues. So here I'll give you Zantac. And if your heartburn goes away, we know that was the issue and, you know, problem solved. And, you know, I, I knew from my research, like, you know, your stomach acid level might be the issue, but only because there's probably not enough of it. So, hey, try this. For six weeks, can you just take out the beer, take out the pizza, you know, these little chocolate chip cookies here and there, just be really strict with me, like, you know, eat meat, fat, some vegetables if you want. And his first response is like, what's the point? I don't, <laughs> what's life without these extras, you know? And I was like, well, it could be great. So he did that. And after three weeks, like we kept a journal of here's what you ate, here's how you felt. And it was not a linear process. It was up and down, up and down. But after a few months, he felt amazing. He had the inflammation that men get with the, um, like puffy in his chest area and kind of a little gut, but very thin legs. And that, I mean, I couldn't believe how fast that went away, just the inflammation. And, you know, taking into consideration, we've been eating really clean by American standards for nearly 20 years. And then, you know, more of a Weston A. Price ancestral diet for 11. So doing pretty well and then making those little tweaks made a huge difference. And you know, now all those little kind of annoying things that I think he needed to live with, he thought that he'd live with for the rest of his life are resolved as long as he stays eating lots of red meat and, you know, keeping that other stuff to a minimum, if at all. 
Yeah, that's really interesting. I think especially with your son, because, you know, when most people probably run into some sort of like digestive issue, it, it seems to me anyway, that it seems to be kind of later on in life. And it's like you can kind of get away with some of the standard American diet type stuff early on in your life, but then eventually kind of catches up to you. Uh, so with your son did uh, when what, so you, you kind of did a reset with him, more or less. Has he tried to or looked into adding anything else back, or is he kind of still doing the same thing? So what's interesting with him is, you know, we really included him in the process. And since I homeschool, I really do have full control of all the nutrition from A to Z. I do all the shopping. We meal plan together. He, you know, the kids cook with me. So they're really involved in not just the eating process, but also everything that goes into that process. So they go with me to farms and things like that. So it was, for him, it was really cool to kind of learn about all this food that he's eating. So he w we were really restricted with him for like 20 months. So from the time he was six or seven until he was about eight or nine, I can't remember exactly the timing, but, um, and then we started adding things in really slowly. The interesting thing is, is that he still reverts back to that those high protein and high fat foods like those are the things he craves when he goes out when we have a little time together he'll say can you take me out for a steak tartare or can we go get some ceviche and that's a huge difference because two years before that he'd be the kid like going for the banana going for the carby stuff that you know gives you that instant energy and like we don't even buy fruit anymore my kids don't eat fruit they don't really even have a taste for it anymore, which is really interesting. So yeah, we did, I'm sorry. So we did incorporate things back in. We um, tested everything. Oh, screen. We tested everything and then, um, yeah, he was able to fully eat everything. So whatever we did to heal his gut or replenish deficiencies or balance out whatever was going on fully worked. And I would claim healing for him because he can eat whatever he wants without getting a stuffy nose. He was getting constant croup, which every parent like is so afraid of because it's that really restricted breathing that's super scary. You're up for nights making sure that their fingernails aren't purple and it's terrible. And for him, his trigger was fruit and nightshades and they would mm. give him croup and it was the weirdest thing. I couldn't even believe that when we took them out, it was an instant like he had no symptoms. Yeah, that's, that's, sorry, Zach. That, that, I mean, that's very interesting with the kids because we see a lot of, you know, like we see that with like even infants with colic, you know, we, you know, and, and, you know, we see kids coming up with colic and you wonder if it's because they're introducing, you know, maybe a bunch of fiber in their diet that they're yeah. not designed well to, to adapt to and, and then, you know, things like croup and stuff like that. So it's good that you've done, like you, read, you wrote it down, you were objective about it. You're saying, hey, maybe this, you know, maybe these bananas aren't all that, they're cracked out to be or so on and so forth. And you, and you, you know, it's like I said, I don't believe that any one food is necessarily evil or, you know, a superfood, you know, I mean, I would maybe other than red meat, but, <laughs> right. but, but I mean, you know, but in general, I think that, uh, uh, you know, you just have to, you'd have to see it. some people for whatever reason, don't do well with, you know, with the supposed, you know, the, the super beneficial fruits and vegetables. And so good on you for trying that. Now, um, I noticed you said you homeschooled, so you have a lot of control. I mean, we see, and I, you know, just as a mom, do you have any concerns? You know, do you, I mean, I'm sure you interact with other moms. Do, do you see any concerns with the, you know, I mean, we see increasingly in the schools, you know, the, the, the nutrition that's being pushed in the schools. I know with my kids, it was, you know, you got to bring a snack for mid morning snack, mid afternoon snack, and it's when they're really little. And then, you know, it's, they're, they're giving out candy as rewards. I mean, Zach was a school teacher for a while. Do you have any, yeah. is that one of the reasons, what are the reasons you're homes? What are, what are the reasons you're homeschooling? Just out of curiosity. Well, I was actually, I went to school for teaching. So I'm by trade. I'm an elementary school teacher. Uh, early childhood development um, was my um, minor. And when I went into the school system to student teach and to do some substitute teaching, I, couldn't stand to be under the fluorescent lights for eight hours, quite honestly. Like I was the teacher or the, the substitute teacher saying, let's take an extra recess and go outside because I couldn't stand the confinement of being in a classroom. And then when I had children, I was like, why would I do that to them? If I can't stand it and I'm, you know, 30, this child who's six is not going to be able to sit there either. And too, like I really enjoy learning and experiencing the world through 
a child's eyes and their questions. It's so much different than just being in a world of grown and a grown up. So at the beginning, it wasn't. Now I see how the benefit of, you know, having a dietary need and then being able to address it when you're home with them. But that wasn't my drive. My drive was to just be able to enjoy almost like a second round of learning with my children and being on our own schedule and learning more life skills and being relaxed and following their lead as to what they're interested in and fostering independence if they wanted to, you know, like my son created his own little business already and he's 12. Mm -hmm. And so I wanted to be able to foster that because I don't really, I'm not in the system. Like I try to do everything that I can to just be independent. Like as a family, my husband works from home, has his own business. I want to be mobile. I want to be fluid. And I feel like teaching those skills to my children is vital, especially right now. Yeah. You know, one thing that I found interesting when I was teaching too, and uh, I think this, I mean, there's certainly still, still going to be issues, but uh, when, cause I was, I did kind of a mix of special education and general education and kind of as I was getting into my teaching career, one big kind of push the educational system was doing uh, in Wisconsin anyway, I don't know if this, how much of this was nationwide, but was this like inclusion uh, process where rather than say taking a student who has, was receiving special education services and completely removing them from their peers and putting them in their own little classroom, uh, they were trying to find ways to bring the special education teachers into the general ed classroom with those students. And, you know, there was a lot of like polarization with that model, but the one thing about it that I thought was just amazing was the response from the general education students that when they were able to kind of see their peers that were receiving special ed services as still their peers and not this like, you know, kid that's kind of off in a corner somewhere in a different part of the building and almost this weird kind of like castaway. And it's interesting because like once we kind of exposed the students to that, they were very receptive to it. They were like, okay, well that student just needs to learn differently. Mm -hmm. There's nothing weird about them. There's nothing wrong with them. And I think that kind of opens up the door, at least uh, kind of trains like the youth to be more understanding of say someone who has to do something differently or chooses to do something a little differently. And, you know, so now like you send your kid to school with a lunch or a snack that is like quite a bit different than their peers there's just less likely, I think, that that environment is going to create a situation where now their friends are making fun of them because they have, you know, like beef jerky as their snack instead of a Kit Kat bar or, you know, they're bringing, you know, something completely different for lunch than what the other kids are eating with their peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, you know, we homeschool, like I said, but we go to lots of, um, we don't belong to a co-op, but we do lots of outside activities. So it's not just me and the kids. It's we go and do things and there's, you know, such a variety of children everywhere that you're dealing, no matter if you're homeschool or in a school building, you're dealing with lots of different, you know, dietary preferences and um, abilities. And, you know, my son who's 12 now, he was a super late reader. And that was another thing where I knew that if he was in a traditional setting that he'd be, I felt like his passions would kind of be squashed because he was slower in math and slower in reading. And, but he was super smart in these other areas. And I really wanted to foster that. And I really felt that the other things would come. And so, and they did. And now he's, I can't get him to put books down. I can't get him to stop asking questions and like tinkering with stuff and figuring out geometry problems. So he loves it. And I just knew from my own experience, unless he got fit with the right teacher every year, that, that those things wouldn't happen. And the last thing I wanted him to do was to hate learning because that's vital. I mean, no matter what, if you can read and you have a passion to learn, like you can do anything. And so that was, that really drove me to just figure out how he learned best. And then I had three subsequent children. They're all different. And so you're constantly learning how to keep them challenged and whatnot. And honestly, good nutrition though, is at the very core. Cause if they can't sit still, if they can't focus and, um, if they're not somewhat in tune with how their body feels, it's going to be an uphill battle with every single thing you try to do.
What has been, uh, you know, because you guys are obviously uh, eating a diet that is, you know, I think is completely normal. <laughs> but, <laughs> right. but, but I mean, there's people that would think it's abnormal. Are you getting yeah. any flack from neighbors, friends, concerned mothers? Is they saying, oh my gosh, you're starving your child? Is <laughs> that occurring to you? You know, it did. And that's why, like, I, I haven't completely shared our, our story, even though it's like five years old, because I, I do have kind of an internal fear or apprehension of like, wow, you only, you only fed your kids, you know, vegetables and meat for two years, you know, it didn't stunt their growth. And, you know, I, I, I really wanted to make sure too, that any effects that we had, any positive effects were lasting because a lot of times people do these um, protocols, you know, usually they're like 30 days, but you know, even longer ones. And then they go back as far as health benefits. So my two hesitations were, you know, possible criticism. And then the other one were like, what if these problems come back up? What if what we experienced was just like a really brief um, healing or resolution and then the, the issues resurface, but they haven't and it's been years. And, you know, I think now that other people are doing and experimenting and being very vocal about it, it's much easier to be confident to share, you know, similar stories. We see that all the time when you can just come out there and people say, Hey, this happened. And other people are more likely to say, Hey, yeah, it happened to me too. And so, yeah, I mean, I, at first I did, my family doesn't think anything of it because I'm, this is just who I am. If everybody's going route a, I'm always going route B. That's just in my personality, good or bad. It's, I always pick kind of the opposite route as other people because I never want to be part of the the herd and kind of, you know, um, what would you say, have those, have contrary voices, not, um, not question things because I think that can happen a lot when you're just going with the flow and doing what other people do is that you stop questioning and stop exploring. And I am always challenging myself to not do that and to look at things more objectively and, you know, keep learning. I don't see any reason why not to. Yeah. So maybe the opposite end of that question then, like, have you had other parents or uh, people come up to you and say, Hey, I see you're doing something differently. Why are you doing it? And then when you kind of explain it to them, they connect dots with their own experience or their own kids experience, then end up kind of taking a path more similar to yours. Yeah, absolutely. One of my really good friends, um, was actually diagnosed with MS when she was 20 and said, you know, they told her in five years she'd be in a wheelchair and she'd never have kids. And now two children later and she's 10 years older and she's also, you know, been doing carnivore on and off with me for a couple of years and um, her kids eat the same as my kids do. And so, you know, you very much do develop a tribe of people who are at the least willing to listen and tolerate what you're doing. And then at, at the most willing to experiment and um, see for themselves. So definitely. And more often than not, it starts with, you know, my child has ABC. What should I do? And my first question is like, what are you eating? What are they eating? I mean, that, that should always be the first question to me as if there's issues, like what is their diet? Like start really simply. No, sorry. Do you, do you find that, uh, I mean, what I've, you know, with, with behavior, particularly with kids, cause you know, one of the things you, you just don't want your kids bouncing off the wall, screaming, you know, being, you know, kind of bratty kids, you know, and, and I found the diet. I mean, I had this with my, with my sister, who's my, you know, my niece who, uh, you know, she was just pretty much a terror, you know, <laughs> and I, and I looked at her diet and I said, my gosh, I told my sister, I said, Hey, Denise, why don't we like clean up the diet? And, we went in and we just like went through the, I went, I mean, literally I was visiting for vacation and we went through the cabinets and just started pulling out all the, the crap that she was giving. And the kid was on the ground, you know, nine years old, like laying on the ground, having a tantrum, tantrum, you know, kicking her feet and screaming like a yeah. <laughs> we were taking it's away hard. All, this, all this crap food. And, you know, and, and, and I talked to her like a month later, she said, yeah, she's like a new kid. She's gotten yeah. better nutrition and it's been very helpful. So it, it, I do think that it impacts, uh, you know, behavior. And I mean, for, for parents that are like, man, it's hard being a parent. And it's particularly hard when your kids are hopped up on the wrong food and, you know, potentially, uh, you know, acting like drug crazed fiends, you know? 
<laughs> well, that's what it is, right? It's just, it's the constant up and down and it, you know, it affects sleep. It affects everything. So it's this huge circle. Like my kids are awesome sleepers and um, I, I'm fully confident that it's because they're well nourished so they can sleep well at night, which means they're calmer during the day, which means they eat better and then they sleep better at night. And this whole, this whole cycle and I, you know, it's all connected. And if you can really get one, um, you know, when, when you can really get like diet under control and you get those proper nutrients in, everything else falls into line. It's just the way it is. Yeah. And, and do you, I mean, like when my kids, I mean, cause I don't have my kids on a fully carnivorous diet. They eat a lot of meat. I mean, that's their mm-hmm. focus. I'm like, yeah. you know, and they don't mind. I mean, they love it. I mean, you know, particularly when I bust out the ribeyes, my daughters are like bolts are <laughs> circling around like, and they're pointing to the rib cap. Cause you know, that's where the <laughs> really, really nice part. They're like, I want that part daddy. And so, you know, I end up giving it to them cause you know, my daughters, I love them, but you know, and, and they, they feast. And then, I mean, I don't have to feed them again for six, eight hours. You know, it's just, yeah. like, they're just not hungry. They run around, they play, they do their things. You, and I mean, I love it on the weekends on breakfast. I mean, I load those kids up with as much high quality, you know, animal nutrition with enough fat in there and they're filled up and they're, and they're gone. And they, and they don't, you know, but whereas before, I mean, it'd be every, like, it seemed like every 15 minutes they're hungry, you know, but yeah. now it's like, you know, they just, they just take care of it and you, and you load them up and it's such an, I mean, I cannot tell you just, just from a parenting management standpoint, you know, you don't, <laughs> instead of having to cook three meals and seven snacks, it's like maybe two meals a day, you load those kids up. Maybe you have a, maybe there's a piece of fruit or something if they need it. But generally, um, you, you load them up on eggs and steak and maybe you, for kids that do tolerate dairy, some dairy. And man, it just, it just makes life easier just from a time management standpoint. And then of course, you don't have the behavioral issues as much, which, you know, obviously some, there's always going to be you know, when you got a bunch of kids, of something going on, <laughs> but you know, it's, it's, it's just, it just makes life easier. Goodness. Yeah. I wish it was a cure for all the bickering and fighting, but unfortunately the effects only go so far, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's amazing. I mean, every morning they, my husband makes breakfast, so it's, you know, eggs, bacon, burgers, and then I make some ancient grain sourdough um, biscuits and I freeze them and they ha- might have one of those. They might not. And they eat next when they're hungry next. And sometimes that's one o'clock and sometimes it's not till nearly dinner. And um, yeah, it saves me from carrying around the huge knapsack of snacks that I dole out every time they, you know, get a sugar low. But yeah, it's, it's amazing. It's very cool. And they, they do eat lots of meat. They don't eat exclusively meat anymore, but they will go through, the three older ones will go through three pounds of meat in one meal without batting an eye easily. Yeah, I mean, for some people that's shocking, you know. For me, <laughs> for me like, it's you know, shocking. I, you know, I, I had a, uh, you know, I had like a two and a half pound tomahawk ribeye last. Night. I was celebrating. <laughs> we launched a website, and, and my book came out last night or yesterday, and so I was like, I'm gonna celebrate with a damn tomahawk, and I might not put that down, no problem. And you know, like, <laughs> I got one for for this. We got an exchange student. Living house. I got one for him too, and I said, Hey, man, we're gonna celebrate. And he got like, oh, he got like a pound and a half in, and you could tell he was just. <laughs> but I mean you, you you develop this capacity where it's like man a pound of meat's nothing it's right like, and, and and many people would say oh my god that's just too much too much but it's it's amazing how well your body adapts to that sort of stuff I mean we had remember Zach we had old Molly Schuyler on the show a <laughs> year. And she's a female it's a tiny I mean she's maybe 120 pounds and she put down 22 pounds of meat in one sitting, which I mean, is just, is just mind boggling. I mean, I, I got up, I think when I, I maxed out at eight pounds, I did that one time. So we had, you know, snake diet, diet, Cole Robinson. Oh yeah. And I did a 48 hour fast, just the first time I've ever done that in my life, just for fun. But I was like, I'm going to eat to prepare for that. So I ate eight pounds, which would be, which, which would be about my food for two days. So I ate two days worth of food in one sitting and then fasted for 48 hours. But I was miserable that was for me. I mean, Three, four pounds is pretty much, I'm getting kind of full, but eight pounds is miserable. Yeah. Um, so what about your, your personal, I mean, so what do you eat every day? What does your diet look like daily? And how often do you eat and do you fast? And tell us a little bit about your, your nutrition strategy. Yeah. So back in June, I took this challenge that was like 150 push-ups and 150 squats a day for 30 days. So I did that on a whim. And like three days into it, I was just so hungry for beef. And I thought, you know what, I'm just going to do this, the carnivore thing again, because I've done it on and off and having nothing wrong with me, so to speak, it's not super motivating to like just eat meat because like, why would you? 
if you don't have a reason to. And then I found out because like four days after eating that way, I felt so great. And like, I wanted to work out more. And I've always worked out since I was 18, like get up at five, get a workout in. Like, this is just my routine every day. So I know how it feels. Um, but I felt really great and strong. And I was like, okay, you know, this is pretty awesome. So I just kept on with the carnivore thing for like three months and, you know, ate two or three times a day, just when I was hungry, ate until I was not hungry anymore. And then ate again the next day. And so I did that for like three months and, you know, lost some weight. As you know, from your other guests, body composition changes a lot. So I really wasn't worried about weight, but I wanted to see more muscle definition and I did. So that was great. And then I was like, okay, that was fun. I'm going to go back to eating, you know, how we did before, which was, I don't know, some vegetables and some sourdough. And I didn't like it. <laughs> it wasn't fun. After three weeks, I gave my body a time to adjust, you know, and um, I didn't like it. So then in October, I went back to just meat, mostly red meat. And I eat once or twice a day when I'm hungry and as much as I want. And it's awesome. I'm way more patient with the kids, which is vital in a house as small as ours with kids as many as mine. Um, patience is like the key. And I sleep awesome. And um, yeah, it's just so easy. It's really simple. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty, you know, like I said, I make the argument, you know, that nutrition should be simple. It shouldn't be anxiety provoking. And it's, it's just crazy that we have so many people that are confused about, well, I mean, it's confusing. It really is for the average person. I mean, there's so many opinions out there on what you should eat. And I say, you know, try it and see what happens. And, and right. the, the funny thing is when a lot of people try this, you know, quote unquote, crazy carnivore diet, a lot of people find it's, it works really well and it's really easy and it, it makes life a lot more simpler. And, you know, you can find your, you can put your energy and stress in, in other, into other endeavors, I suppose. You it's know. true. I have lots more, even being as busy, well, busy, right? Everybody's busy, but as busy as I am with the kids and stuff, it's like, I do have more time and I am doing more things with that time and not meal planning and not figuring out recipes. And it's like, it's great. Well, it is kind of funny because I think like when it comes to nutrition, I think a lot of times we start from like as complex as it gets. And when people start to find success, it seems like they start whittling it down and they go back to kind of like this really simple, basic, like really low stress, easy to uh, adhere to type of an approach. And when I think about that, it's really kind of fascinating to me because like with any other type of learning, we would be starting with the basics, something very simple, and then you'd become proficient in that. And that's when we'd start adding things to the equation, mm -hmm. not start with this massive equation <laughs> and whittle it down to like, you know, a couple variables. So like it is, it's weird that we kind of do it the other way with, with nutrition a lot of times. Yeah. When we were really restricted um, with my son, we were imagining all these things that we'd have once he was kind of healed up and he could handle things like, what do you want to make? Oh, well, we'll do these, you know, extravagant meals. We'll be able to have this and that. And then it came time to add stuff back in. It was like, what do you want? He's like, can you just make me a burger? <laughs> like, oh, <laughs> okay, sure. <laughs> like, I guess we're, this is just what we're sticking with now. Like you don't even have the, he doesn't even want like a smoothie or anything. It's like, just, can you make me a burger? The other day he made his own salmon ceviche. He's like, digging in the freezer and found one last piece of frozen salmon and sliced it up and made a ceviche and great. He could have chosen anything out of that freezer and that's what he chose. So <laughs> you know, it's pretty telling, especially with kids. If you can get them in tune with their bodies really early, it's amazing the choices they make because one of the other fears or things people have said, if you ever read parenting blogs, which are just mostly terrible, and they just make you scared of everything. But it was like, if you restrict your kids, you're fostering eating disorders. They're going to binge on sugar and whatever. And I was like, well, I guess we'll see. And no, it didn't. It changed their food preferences and increased their health to the point where, like I said, within an hour, they can tell if that food made them feel <laughs> gross. And they will say, I am never having that brownie again, or I am not doing that again. And they won't. Like, they they have such a short and quick like biofeedback loop compared to grown-ups, And if you can just get that, get their diet cleaned up, they can tell you and, you know, help self-evaluate as to what makes them feel good, perform well. You know, my, my son skateboards and so does my husband. And, 
my son found out like he does better with either a fasted or a very light breakfast before he skateboards. And then when he comes home is when he wants like make me a burger, give me some broth. Like he loads up then. And he figured that out for himself at age like 10 or 11, you know? So it's very, I think empowering to kids and important for them to get in tune with their bodies as early as they possibly can. Like, how did that make you feel? Were you able to run? Were you able to exercise? Could you focus? And you can ask those questions in a very, non-confrontational and conversational way so that they don't feel like what they're doing is wrong or bad um, and just help them be in tune with what's going on. Now for a word from our sponsors. All right, folks, this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast is brought to you by ButcherBox. ButcherBox offers you convenience by delivering your meat right to your door with free shipping. They also offer quality by having options such as 100% grass-fed and grass-finished beef, heritage breed pork, and free-range chicken. They also offer value with their goal to make clean meat accessible to as many people as possible by partnering with a collective of small farms. They are able to deliver you the best products for less than $6 per meal. They often run promos on their website for subscribers to get things like free pork or free bacon. If you enter promo code HPO at checkout, you can also knock an additional $20 off your first subscription. So head over to butcherbox.com and place your first order. Now back to the show. I think that's a great sentiment. And, I, and, I, and you know, my kids, I had them reading labels on food, so they know what they're eating. You know, as soon as they could read, I said, Hey, you know, you, you tell kids as soon as they're young enough not to run in the street, you know, you teach them not to run in the street. And so I think the same thing with food. I mean, I think it does play a role in our health. And I think it, that's very good to say, Hey, look, let's learn what that food does have an impact on the way you feel and perform and what your body's going on. And I think that's great for kids to realize that. So they don't discover that when they're 50 like me, you know, or something like, or 45 like me. I mean, you figure that out early on. I mean, we kind of have a general idea, but I mean, you know, to specifically say, hey, look, if I eat, you know, if I have a bunch of, you know, sugar, I'm going to have an acne breakout or a dairy or something Mm -hmm. like that. So that's important to to realize. I was talking, you know, you're talking about the kids who are running where I was going to ask Zach, because I don't think I've ever asked you this, Zach, because you do a lot of training runs in the morning. Mm -hmm. Um, Are you eating? What are you doing? Are you eating before then? Are you just, are you just going out running fast? What are you, what are you doing? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, no, it's, uh, it is interesting. I would say my biggest meal of the day is dinner the night before. So I'm usually not waking up with like hunger pangs and in which case I'll just have like a cup of coffee or tea or something like that. Maybe a little heavy whipping cream or something like that in it, a little bit of raw honey from time to time, depending on how big the training block is. But Calorie wise, it's really low before, you know, maybe, maybe a hundred at most 200 or so calories before I head out and I'll do that morning session and then I'll come back and I'll eat, eat a pretty big meal after that as well. And a lot of my kind of eating patterns are more aligned with like two really big meals a day. And then I fill in the gaps as needed when training kind of flares up and my energy demands are a lot higher. Uh, but yeah, you know, I don't, I don't really like to kind of go back to what we were talking about with like fasting before. I'm not a huge fan, especially for endurance athletes in forcing fasting for certain, uh, partly just because like when we look at it from an energy expenditure framework versus a time framework, like what most fasting protocols are going to be, it's just apples and oranges at that point when you're someone who's, you know, maybe burning double your resting metabolic rate due to the amount of running you're doing. So for me, if I wake up and I'm hungry, that's just a sign to me that, well, you know, maybe I didn't quite eat as much for dinner as I normally would, or maybe I burned more calories the day before than I thought I had. And, you know, I'm a little hungry and then I'll, I'll eat something if it, if it, if I notice that, but it's pretty intuitive for the most part. And then, you know, you get years and years of it. You can almost predict kind of how your body's going to respond after just having, you know, countless scenarios, uh, adding into the kind of the pile of information you have. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's, you know, similar kind of what I do. I mean, I, I, if I'm, if I'm training early, I don't, I don't eat much. I mean, I, I, you know, for me, well, for me, it's mostly uh, a big meal the night before, or, you know, like today I had steaks for breakfast and I'll, I'll train later today. But I mean, that, mm-hmm. that, that just works well for me. Now you said you did this. Have you found um, a lot? Cause Susie, do you mind if I ask you how old you are? I'm almost 42. 42. And you know, a lot of women in their forties start to see 
problems with weight gain. Are you, how are you doing with, with just maintaining muscle and are you, are you finding that uh, body composition is, is staying pretty well with, with this sort of diet strategy? Yeah. I mean, I think I've always been within 15 pounds of the same weight. So I've never had like a weight issue. I'm still nursing my youngest right now. So my body is hanging on to a little bit more fat in the, my lower body as I would expect it to. Um, but yeah, I mean, like, I think I look pretty good and <laughs> I, mean, I don't know. I think my body composition looks great and, um, there's always room for improvement. Like I'm lifting. I think I was scared for a long time to lift heavy weights too, and was really into running, not like Zach running, but like, you know, an hour a day and then, you know, not eating enough protein. So I do think that I probably compromised my muscle integrity for a lot of years. And so to me, I'm kind of, now that I've resolved that I really enjoy eating a lot of meat and lifting heavy weight, I almost feel like I'm healing my body just from like calorie restriction and not lifting enough weights. And so like weight wise or body wise, I think I look good and healthy, but I know that I'll look and feel even better as I continue to um, feed my muscles and work them in the way that they need to be worked for just living. I mean, I don't want to end up with, you know, brittle bones and not being able to function. And um, I don't, I mean, I feel like I feel better now and look better now than when I was 20 as far as health, you know? Um, so yeah, I, I haven't really had any issues, but I always feel like maybe they're around the corner. I don't even know. I don't pay attention. <laughs> well, you know, it is interesting. Cause like we've had, we've had a few like, protein research, some of the top protein researchers in the, in the country on the show. And, you know, the thing that they really highlighted that I found interesting was just bone health and what role yeah. protein plays in that. And, you know, that was enough to kind of really make me think like, okay, well, especially as I get older, minus the fact that I'm running, you know, however many miles and racing and stuff like that. But just, you know, the last thing I want to be is, you know, in my seventies or eighties and have like, weak, brittle bones to the point where like, you fall, you break a hip or break a leg. And that's, you know, basically the end of you at that point, because you're, you're yeah. probably coming back from that. If you're 80 and you break a hip or break a bone, that could be, uh, what kind of causes you never to get be remain active enough. And, you know, if you're bedridden, you're old, you start to lose like the will to be alive even <laughs> and sometimes. So it's like, for me, I was like, I don't want to say scared, <laughs> but like, yeah, that's not the right word for it. But maybe informed enough where like I'm focusing on the highest quality protein and trying to hit mid to upper limit or it, mid to upper ranges that are required for, for an athlete. Cause I do know that like, you know, I'm young now, but maybe I won't, well, I definitely won't be down the road. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, I think too, uh, women just in general, I mean, I, we didn't even have a TV growing up. So I grew up in a really kind of weird household, reading labels, not watching TV, but still I had, you know, I'm a woman. And so it was very much like be thin and you don't want to lift heavy weights. You don't want to be bulky and you ate very little, you ate salads. I mean, that's just the mentality I think that women have in general. Um, and you know, I guess through media, but I wasn't even exposed to media and still I had that mentality. So I feel like, you know, at 40, I still had plenty, plenty of time to kind of undo the psychological damage or the psychological effects of those messages. And um, and for my daughters too, to set the example, like they see me putting down steaks and eggs, like I don't count calories. I never have, but like, I, there's no restriction. And they see that. And my oldest daughter, who is almost 10, you know, she's out in the backyard doing handstands and she's ripped. I mean, this girl is like, you know, not formally exercising, but she can move her bodies in ways that a lot of kids her age can't. And um, it's just, it's remarkable. And she'll be like, look at my muscles, check out my muscles. It's like, yes, like you are <laughs> on the right path. That's exactly what I want to hear. Like eat your, <laughs> eat your, you know, food and go run around and do all these things, move your body in ways that's going to, you know, really benefit you in the long run. Yeah. You know, that is interesting that you, w what you mentioned where like, you know, you weren't watching TV, so you maybe weren't seeing advertisements for like, you know, women need to be skinny or yeah. get down to a size zero type of a, like message out there. But even without that, it's still, it shows how ingrained that was in the, or is and was in the culture for, for expectations of women. And uh, I think we're at least turning that massive ship to a degree at this point in time. And I would love to hear your 
thoughts on that? Like, do you think uh, just from the, like women that you're talking to young, old or otherwise, are they starting to say like, Hey, you know, we don't need to be pencil thin. We would rather be, you know, muscular or strong and, you know, have this like r maybe range of expectations as opposed to this is the one way to go. Yeah. I think that's really hard question to answer because there's what we say out loud. Mm -hmm. And then there's that little voice in the back of your head when you go through like Instagram or Facebook and you see people really thin that can put on any clothes and they fit and they look good. And you're like, God, but I really love to be skinny, you know? So mm -hmm. I think, I just think, and I think for, I mean, I'm not obviously a man, but I assume for a man, it's, you know, almost the opposite. It's like, man, I'd love to have that six pack. So we have these opposite expectations of what we want to look like or want to do. But I do think it's changing. People really want to be healthy. I find in my age group, people really are looking for like true health. They're not looking for the next diet. They will just do anything to feel good because by my age, lots of people are already on medications. I mean, by 41, 42, my husband's like almost 45. They're on multiple medications already. So they're just wanting to feel good when they wake up in the morning. And so people really, and I think we can tell by just the carnivore movement and like paleo and those different things, people are really looking for real health. And people will stay on, you know, carnivore, even though they're gaining weight because they feel so much better. And that's such a divergence from other so-called diets, because if you're not losing weight, you're off. If I'm counting calories all day and abiding within these rules and I'm not losing weight on another diet, I'm gone because that's the only reason I'd be on a diet. Um, and with this way of eating, it's very different because you notice like me, I had no digestion issues. I wasn't super overweight. I just was like, I'll just try it. And I feel so good. Like I felt good before, but the improvements are so subtle that you keep doing it. Even if, you know, that initial like, Ooh, I could get skinny. Even if that doesn't happen, the other improvements are amazing. Yeah. I mean, there's a lot, that's one thing I've seen a lot of people just, they just are, their health improvements are so much better. They just feel better regardless of what happens with their, with their dress size. So I think that's a, that's an important concept to, to do. Um, so as far as, you know, with, with kids, do you, you know, you, you, you know, the concern was only eating meat and then maybe some vegetables are going to be stunted if they're not eating, you know, 8,000 calories of carbohydrates a day. <laughs> Um, do you have any, are your kids healthy? I mean, they're having any trouble. Yeah, no, they're so healthy. We actually, you know, we measure them like parents do on the wall. And during the two years that my son was very restricted, he had his biggest growth spurt. So obviously his body was getting everything he needed and his issues were allergies, food intolerances. He had a speech impediment. He, um, was like still wetting the bed when he was almost seven there was all these little things. And um, I mean, they resolved one by one, little by little. And so, um, no, quite the opposite. I mean, not only did those issues resolve, but he grew. Um, he's excelling in sports. He's excelling in school. Uh, my other children are average. They're not huge kids. Me and my husband are really not very tall and not very heavy. So they're not going to be giant kids, but they're all super healthy. Like they rarely get sick. And, their kids. So I'm doubt they're washing their hands when they should be. And we go lots of places and they are super healthy and they are, of course, I'm a little bit biased, but they're really smart and very coordinated and all these things that some of which I thought were taught or hereditary, but I'm not so sure now. I think a lot comes back to what they're, what they're eating. Have, uh, have you been able to influence other parents to, to, do, to eat similar to you or to, to have you had any success with people around you? Yeah, there's, uh, <laughs> I'm not, I don't know. I think my brother is on board now. Uh, I went over there and brought some treats because I thought he wanted to share a coffee and some rolls. And he's like, no, I'm just eating meat. And I was like, that's awesome. <laughs> like we can do that. Let's throw these things away and have our coffee. A few of my friends are now doing it, kind of following my footsteps, getting, you know, giving it 30 days and seeing what happens. And uh, yeah, I think a lot of people are, of course, a lot of people aren't as well. But, you know, I feel like if you're living authentically and doing your thing and just being positive and encouraging people, you know, if 
if they see that what you're doing is working, they'll ask the questions and you feed it to them little by little and they'll get there. Yeah. And I think, uh, there is a lot of power behind like working with people from where they're at and some people where they're at is not a place where being told what to do is going to make a whole lot of movement. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, sometimes you just have to let things kind of happen and you're like, right. If you kind of like lead by example, I think sometimes that that can be a pretty powerful message. Yeah. I, I'm seeing, you know, it's kind of funny uh, since I've been doing this sort of meat only thing for three years now. And I, I'm now starting to see a lot of people This it's kind of in the background of people talking about it. And, you know, you, you overhear, oh, yeah, I'm doing the all meat diet. So it, 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 it's, 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 people are experiencing it. And, and it's not that every single person is going to stick with it, but I think there's enough interest. It's, it's kind of fun watching this uh, movement grow. And, uh, you know, we, there, I think there's a lot of potential here. And, uh, you know, I'm certainly invested. Uh, you know, emotionally and, and uh, you know, work, work wise into, into making this happen. Are, are you seeing, uh, are you seeing less of a, you're totally crazy response now than, than you would have maybe a few years back? Oh yeah, absolutely. I mean, um, it's a lot. I think, you know, probably started with like the paleo movement where people were like, Hey, maybe it's not great to be eating pastries at every meal. And um, people got used to that idea, just eating like fruits, vegetables, meat, keep it really simple. And then it progressed and progressed and progressed. And definitely now I think it's, I don't think it's mainstream, but it's definitely getting out there and it's, it's having people investigate things like cholesterol, you know, what's that all about? And, you know, is it really this thing to be scared of? So people are actually starting to learn kind of the real science instead of like the bought and paid for science. Um, as far as what we've been told about things like cholesterol and insulin and um, I don't know, agriculture and things like that, where people are seeing success with people that are eating differently. And then they're diving into the science behind it. Like, why is this working? If we've been told for the past, I don't know, 70 years that it shouldn't work. Why is this working that it seems impossible? And so then maybe they try it and then maybe they investigate into, you know, they find a local farmer or something. So it's this whole big investigation process that I feel like, you know, it happens one family at a time. So it feels really slow because we've been on this, you know, my husband and I have been on this journey for so long, but it really is one kind of one family at a time. But then you get authentic change and authentic investment into properly raised animals and, um, regenerative agriculture and things like things that actually matter in the long run rather than just changing whatever you're buying from the grocery store, which I think is more important anyway. And then when you're conversing with people and you're talking about this, you, you can back it up with you know, studies about cholesterol or studies about sugar because you know, because you were questioning it. And then you, like me, I was just like binge listening to all these different podcasts so that I understood why it was working what these studies were talking about and what they meant. And then that gave me a better platform to speak to other people and where I share information to be able to refer them to, you know, articles or other experts in the area. And so I think the change is slow and I think people probably think it's still a little bit crazy, but I think it's authentic change and lasting change. I think that's what matters most. Yeah, amen to that. I think that is that is important. And, and I always talk about one of the biggest things when I when I talk to people I consult with and, and the, now the, the coaches that I'm certifying, I want to really emphasize that changing a relationship, changing your relationship with food and nutrition is the, the, the fundamental process that needs to happen. And, you know, once you stop eating for boredom, anxiety, stress relief, entertainment, social pressure, acculturation, then you you just get healthy and, and it, it's such a, you know, and it, and it, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to be just only meat, but mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when you're eating food to fuel your body and that's the reason you eat the same reason you breathe, the same reason you do any physiologic process and we, we distance ourselves. And I know there's people that say food is a celebration and there's a social, but you can, you can damn sure celebrate eating a steak. I mean, there's no, Absolutely. there's no, there's no thing that you can't have a big, <laughs> big cookout and a barbecue and it can't yeah. be a great social occasion. I mean, I, I do it every day. I'm damn day. Yeah. I'm happy. Anyway, Zach, uh, this is, has been really, sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. And I was just going to say, it is funny what we do decide to consider like celebratory, like food <laughs> or that we use that <laughs> as a celebratory thing in the first place. But yeah, like we, like, why a cupcake 
versus right. uh, a burger or a steak. <laughs> well, I mean, back yeah. in the old days, I mean, it was a big celebration. You'd kill the fat, fatted calf yeah. and you'd, you'd mm -hmm. have a big, that was the celebration. And now it's like you go get the, uh, you know, the, the, the Crisco powdered sugar laden <laughs> cake from, from Walmart. And that's your celebration, you know, because everybody's getting their, they're getting their sweet sugar high on. But I mean, yeah. <laughs> really, it's, it's, there's no reason you can't get, sit around and, and cook up some nice steaks and hamburgers and sausages and, and just, man, and that feels good too. I think we just need to find a way to like write happy birthday on a steak and I think we'll be good to go. <laughs> Get a big old iron and just stamp it on there. Yeah, that might be, that might be, a, that might be a business idea, Jack. I love it. <laughs> well, All I'll right. tell you what, this has been wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, do you want to let, can you let people know where they might want to, if they want to get in for more information or get in touch with you, Susie? Oh, sure. Well, thanks for having me, first of all. Um, and I do have a blog um, over at yogapantsandbonbons.com. Uh, it's well, just real food recipes right now and homeschooling stuff and uh, natural remedies. And I will be sharing our, our story on there soon. And on Instagram, I'm at yogapantsandbonbons as well. And then my carnivore journey, I have a separate uh, Instagram account at the carnivore mama. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Susie, for taking some time out and coming on the show. Uh, we will be sure to link those uh, social media handles and uh, your blog and stuff to the show notes so listeners can click through that and find out what you're up to. Great. Thank you so much for having me. Have a great day. Hey, folks. Human Performance Outliers podcast is growing. And due to the growth, we are looking to take on some new sponsors. So if you feel like your company or organization would be a good fit for our audience, please do not hesitate to reach out to hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Human Performance Outliers podcast with hosts Dr. Sean Baker and Zach Bitter. If you enjoyed the show, please consider following us on social media and checking out our websites. Links to those can be found in the show notes. Also, if you have any questions or comments, please do not hesitate to shoot us an email at hpopodcast at gmail.com. Thanks again for tuning into the show.